Good morning. On the screen in front of you is the uh, new commuting vehicle for Frank Sporky, but Frank didn't see that, and I got no reaction. Okay. Glad you're here. Glad we can uh, share this. You know, it's getting a little chillier. I'm noticing there, the guy, more, there are more guys with ties than usual. I mean, you, you know, you don't have to wear a tie to come here at all, but it's because we know they're also scarves, and it's kind of chilly. Um, in addition to the usual announcements we have here, I want Carol to come and, and give us one. You want your usual mic, or what do you want to do? Or come out, come out. Uh, pick me. Okay. Oh, grass. <laughs> Um, we get our food supplies when we make the Father Bill's meals from the South Shore Food Pantry, and it's in the same building as the Weymouth Food Pantry. And the Weymouth Food Pantry has asked, is there someone who would like to make a meal once a month, and it's going to get packaged and frozen, something like mac and cheese or American chop suey or maybe a soup. It's going to be frozen and given to shut-ins. There, um, the supplies would all be provided, the containers would be provided. It's just someone who likes to cook and can cook big. Or maybe it's a few people, you know. So if you would like to help that, um, that endeavor, um, please see me or Ellie. That's you, Ellie. <laughs> Thank you. Great, great. And, and in the line of soup and other meals, um, Donna mentioned to me that um, I mean, this year, the, the sign-up on the soup, chowder, and chili challenge is real low. If you'd be like to do that, they really need to hear today. So please talk to her. Please talk to her as you're going through and getting four pieces of baked goods or whatever. So that'd be fine. Also, just another unscheduled announcement is that David and Susan Gray are needing to rest one more day before they come in. And so if you're part of that group, I was supposed to tell Tom Finney, I don't see him yet. Um, they're gonna, it's going to kind of need to make sure that there is an alternate leadership. So. That's, that's the option there. Now for your regularly scheduled announcements. Tonight uh, we have our usual 5.30 p.m., first and third Sundays, uh, contemporary service we call Relevant. Uh, Sarah always gives me a, a chance to look at her message, and something that Sarah is very good at is taking an analogy and applying the spiritual uh, application for it. I won't tell you what it is, but I will say that it has something to do with her state of life, and you can go on from that. Mm. Guys are saying, I don't want to know too much. But <laughs> come, great music. The Gernhards are just real uh, uh, joyful, uh, gifted musicians and worship leaders. And so come and take part in that tonight, 530. Right, thank you, thank you, right. We are adapting and, and being in here. Uh, there's a new Bible study, the All Church Study, Abraham's Journey and Yours. Today is the second week of that, of that series. And so... Uh, uh, <laughs> It'd be hard to read. You have to call Sue Gray to take part in a group right now since she's not here today, but we can also help you connect up with those. There are schedules of the different groups that are available. Oh, yes, the packets for the leaders um, of the materials are available in the basket in the fellowship hall. Great. Okay, and uh, just a reminder, these next two slides are about helping out as uh, we give Sarah some time to focus on being a mom um, as uh, that day approaches, as we're looking for people to help lead uh, ECHO, our youth group, and Grades and Grace. Uh, ECHO is, is Fridays, 6 to 8 p.m. Uh, you'd be helping out Nick, and we have a couple other teen uh, helpers, but it'd be great to have somebody with a driver's license and things like that. Um, and then on Wednesday from 5.30 to 7 is our homework help, uh, Grades and Grace. So there's a need for an extra helper with that. And also, um, just, just want to make sure everybody knows that that's available. I think as early as, as grade five or so on up through, it's a great place to have a, a safe and friendly place to, uh, for homework to be done, get a little help from an adult if you need it, and, uh, and we'll feed you. So that's going on too. Um, a week from today will be the Walk for Humanity. This is a restoration of something that... Uh, kind of got waylaid by COVID and some other things, but it's a chance for some area churches that we call the Cranberry Council to get together and, um, and, and, and make a difference by uh, raising funds for the area food pantries. So if you'd like to do that, there's some sign-up sheets already on the, uh, on the table that's adjacent to the famous coffee hour buffet, um, but uh, 
You can, you can walk or you can be a walker, uh, or you can be a, a supporter. Operation Christmas Child, we're looking to have those boxes returned within two weeks. The, the information on it is further back toward the library as you go there. So encourage your support for that. Great thing going on. So good. Those are our announcements for the uh, start of our time. And you know, our life together is a reflection of the grace we have received in Jesus Christ, who loved us, came for us, died and rose again, and who changes our lives and gives us the ability to look toward others because we know we're being taken care of. And in response to that, we, we seek to worship him. In response to that, we seek to serve him. But service and worship are related in that it's one form of serving him is to honor him. So we're going to stand together and we're going to sing first the potter's hand. Please stand.
Please join me in the call to worship. It's taken from Psalm chapter 8, verses 1, 4, 6, and 9. O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, what are human beings that you are mindful of them, mortals that you care for them? You have given them dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under their feet. O oh Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Please be seated. Now, this is a time when many, many are concerned with good reason. Some of the world events and what is happening in Israel and along the Gaza Strip and many other things. And it's a time to pray for peace. It's a time for certainly peace with justice. And one of our leaders, Ashley Clear, sent this prayer um, that let's just pray kind of separate from that as we all know that there's many different ways this thing could go. Uh, this is a prayer for, for God to work good things. Let's pray. Almighty God, our hearts ache as once unimaginable horror ravages precious lives for reasons we will never understand. 
Hear our prayers for those who dwell in a land of war, for their loved ones near and far who grieve brutal, sudden loss, for the suffering we can see and deeper anguish shrouded by the urgency of terror. We seek wisdom for decision makers, individuals making choices in an instant when neighborhoods are turned into battlefields, and leaders whose actions impact countless souls. When we wonder how to respond, remind us of Micah's call to do justice, love kindness, and live humbly with you. Remind us as well of Isaiah's vision of the day when nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Hasten that day, Lord. We pray in the name of Jesus, the Prince of Peace. Amen. And I do want to thank you all for the for continuing to keep us informed of the different prayer concerns and situations that are going on in our um, in our in our fellowship and our in our life together, and I uh, just want us to uh, keep in mind, uh, remember that uh, Corinne had her uh, had the loss of her grandson Cody, and there will be a memorial service this week for that. Let's hold her and all of her family for that. Um, also, Tammy Perry's dad is is in hospice and the family's kind of bracing for that one. Please join me in prayer. Lord, we thank you that you do answer prayers. We thank you that uh, uh, the Grays have indeed recovered from COVID. We just pray you continue to help them with the rest that they need. And we want to thank you. Karen Santafati's had a good week. And we pray, Lord, that there could be continued progress and that this T-cell transplant would uh, really take root. You'd use it in whatever means you have to give her great relief from the cancer that she's been battling now for 12 years. So Lord, hold them in, in your care. Be with Norma, Danielle, Pete. With Linda, Lord, at Southwood. Uh, thank you for bringing Earl, Mary's brother, through surgery, and would you grant him continued steady progress. Be with Mim's sister, Jean, in the hospital with some respiratory. For our Mary Ann Johnson, Lord, healing from her respiratory situation. Thank you for bringing Donna Walsh through her surgery. She reports great progress and is eager to be back with us. Thank you, Lord, for doing that. And would you grant that kind of healing for Debbie Duke in the hospital at South Shore? And Lord, around the world, there are many grieving. We pray your mercy upon those who have already lost loved ones for those who have a loved one who is being held hostage lord let there be grace that comes out of this horror you are able to turn darkness into night death into resurrection lord we continue to pray for the other areas afghans had another earthquake afghanistan and and the war continues in Ukraine. We, we pray, Lord, um, also for Armenian refugees, Azerbaijan. There's so many trouble spots that seem to have exploded lately. Lord, calm the troubled waters, please. We thank you for uh, Joan Delano and John. Pray you give them safety in their travels back to Florida by, Florida by means of Tennessee. Lord, for all who have a particular challenge Maybe there's somebody they need to talk to this week with a conversation that won't be easy. Maybe there is a financial hurdle that must be overcome. Maybe there is a need for a new direction in a relationship. Lord, we all face challenges. We have things that could keep us awake at night, but be the one who gives us a song in the night to calm our souls and guide us in the right paths. Help us as a church, Lord, to embrace the pilgrims that come our way, that you send our way on their own spiritual journey. And help us to keep our eyes on you as we walk forward into your light. We pray this in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We respond to God's love for us with many ways, acts of service, but also with giving a portion of the income he gives us to his work. Much of it beyond our doors. But how we give, it's not only simply funding something, it's also telling God, we thank you, we love you, we are dedicated to you. And so we make a gift in the back at the uh, plate, the baskets that are there. We mail it in, we use the QR code on the website or the donate tab at the website. Uh, but we offer it to God. Let's dedicate it now. Lord, thank you that though the cattle on a thousand hills are yours, you just allow us to contribute to what you're doing. Thank you, God, for this uh, chance to be a fellowship together. Thank you for the uh, way you allow us to pool resources to be about your ministry. And grant that we would always, Lord, be found faithful in what we, how we use it, where we give it, how it is used. And Lord, accept with these gifts the dedication of our hearts. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Please join us in the song of thanksgiving in his time. Our scripture reading this morning is from John, chapter 1, verses 43 through 51. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him about whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said of him, Here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, Where did you get to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered, Do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, 
Very truly, I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. This is the word of the Lord. about that song is you know, when I as a high schooler and even into college some you know I, I was reading the Bible and there were things that would strike me and there'd be other things that seemed like 
meh, you know, I, I didn't understand it. And there were like two schools of thought. I, could, I knew there were scoffers who said, well, the whole book's just made up or it's got good intentions, but it's leaky and everything else. And the more I got some serious study and learned about background, something I try to do for you all, the more I realized because it's the word of God, it, the Bible rewards prayerful study. The more, the, the, always there's more to find and there's riches there. So that prayer that let these ancient words impart, give us something that God has for us. So true, so good, so important. <clears throat> and then on the other side of things, Father Abraham had many sons, many sons had Father Abraham, I am one of them, and so are you. So let's just praise the Lord. None of this right arm, like, no, 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 no. <laughs> but we sang a song in Sunday schools, Bible camps, all sorts of situations, usually with silly body motions. But what does that song keep reiterating? The idea that Abraham is somehow father to all of us. How can that be? I'll get back to that. In the 1920s, many people began to worry that the increasing urbanization of America would grind down on people's souls. And many initiatives responded to that program. Probably my favorite was the Appalachian Trail, 2,100 mile footpath along the Appalachian mountain ridge from Georgia to Maine a key attribute was that at least some of it would fall within 100 miles of most of America's populations at the time. The idea was it would give people a chance to be refreshed by solitude and natural beauty with day hikes, picnics, or over, overnight journeys. And several of us here can testify that places of unparalleled beauty can be found there. This picture I took last Friday in New Hampshire there. Now a lesser response to the urbanization problem was the Gordon Rest Home, a lesser known. Not a place, as we might think from the name, for aging senior citizens, but a respite for single professional women, usually from within Boston, who could leave the city for a week and come enjoy a place of peaceful, natural beauty in the lovely unknown town of Hanson, Massachusetts. This church cooperated with a ministry known as King's Daughters and repurposed a former parsonage. Am I getting this right, historians? I think so. As urban stress spread, First Congregational Church of Hanson, you've heard of them, offered relief by means of exposure to nature. Well, the earliest chapters of Genesis describe many extraordinary moments in earliest human history. Now, we may not understand fully what happened there, but we can gain insight from the order of the different episodes. And there's some patterns there to instruct us. Many other things, too, but some of the patterns instruct us. Well, we know that as human evil cratered to new depths prior to the flood which destroyed the known world it's chronicled in the histories of several cultures god intervened with a better alternative he had noah give human civilization this gigantic reboot uh, by means of a rescue ship and we will find something similar in today's introduction to father abraham and his obedience to god's call to an unprecedented journey, because we find a new episode in humanity's moral bankruptcy. I'm going to be reading to you from Genesis 12, but in Genesis 11, you read about the leaders of the people seeking by building the world's first skyscraper to create a life for themselves where they are God's equal. It's the story of the Tower of Babel. Well, knowing that people with unrestrained power end up abusing the powerless, have you noticed? God not only foiled the conspiracy against him, but promoted a positive alternative. Near crisis, positive alternative. 
And I'm going to read to you now Genesis 12 to 1 to, 1 to 5. And as I do, notice that as a correction to this near disaster, God chose one man to be the beginning of his new people, Father Abraham. This is Genesis 12, 1 to 5. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you. And make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abraham went, as the Lord had told him, and Lot was with him, a nephew. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Abraham took his wife Sarai, his brother's son Lot, and all the possessions they had gathered. And the persons whom they acquired in Haran, they set forth to go to the land of Canaan. Jesus reminded us of the goodness of God to all people. He called to mind how God causes the rain to fall on the fields of the just and the unjust. God's goodness means that we are never left with problems that have no solutions. Maybe that's all you needed to hear today. <laughs> the Tower of Babel was just one of countless examples of the problem of evil. 2,000 years before the birth of Christ, that's Abraham's time, God began to explicitly prepare the human race for his solution to our greatest problem, the cross. The verses I read to you are key to understanding the whole Bible. Every event in the rest of the Old Testament follows the outline of that encounter I read for you between God and the human representative he chose. Here we find out why the nation of Israel is important. For someone will come from them who will give the whole world access to the blessing of God. Funny thing about Father Abraham, by the time he's introduced in chapter 11, he's already known as being childless. God is going to offer a solution to that as well, the details will wait for another week. What's important to understand today is that we call him Father Abraham because he was the first to walk the journey God wants us all to join. This next slide, remember it from last week? Abraham had started his journey in the city of Ur near the top of the Persian Gulf. That's in the kind of lower right-hand corner there. Ur. Net near to today's Kuwait, Ur probably provided battleground for that first Gulf War in 91. Abraham had gone as far as Haran, which is kind of top center of the slide, right under the J in journey. Stayed there for generations. But now God said, it's time for you to take your own journey. Abraham's journey is his own journey, but there's much about it that informs your life and mine. Because as we said last week, we're on a journey with him as well. Because God loves us, loves you, each one of you, and loves me. He does not abandon us to grope about in the dark. He knows we need help. Each component of the journey God calls us, calls Abraham to, has a parallel in the journey he has for you. So first of all, consider the call. The Lord said from Abraham, go from your country, your kindred, and your father's house to the land I will show you. I, the land I will show you. <laughs> Again, we like to know the details of what we are getting ourselves into. <laughs> God offers no such details. God does not need to bargain with us. We live in his world, not the other way around. Too often, though, we act as if God has to measure up to our standards. Really? Why do we do that? We can only conceive of doing that if we have a small view of God. 
not a view that recognizes that this world had a beginning and that the first cause is and has to be a force tremendously greater than any of us. However, Abram asks for none of that. These verses depict him having an encounter with God that is self-validating. We don't know how God spoke to him, but clearly it was kind of convincing. Abraham is willing to go into the unknown. Wow. But he does know something. One of my mentors in Indiana, in the church that I served there, was a fellow named Don Buckthall. He told a story that some of you have heard me share at funerals. A man is invited by a friend to spend a weekend at his hunting cabin in the woods. The guest arrives and finds the uh, friend in the cabin, and a fire is roaring in the fireplace. The guest sits in a comfortable chair, and then suddenly there's this loud racket, a scratching at the door, and the host goes to the door, opens it, and this great big golden retriever charges in, kind of jumps up on the master, you know, the paws on the shoulders, and just loves on him. And the guest is astonished. He said, he didn't know I was in here. And he didn't know if I was a friend or a foe. He could have been rushing into a dangerous situation. But still, he came eagerly. And the host said, all you have to say is true. But you forgot to mention the most important thing. My dog knew that I was here. And he wanted to be with me. He knew that if he was with me, everything would be all right. Abraham didn't worry about what was unknown in God's call in his life. Neither should we. Wherever God takes us, he will be there so we can be with him. The first part of God's call is to obey. His call to us is for us to obey him. Carol and I heard Billy Graham say to 18,000 fellow college students a few years ago um, that Jesus has had two verbs, come and go. Come unto me, all you are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. And then he said, go and make disciples from among all peoples. Now, he may and certainly does have different unique roles for each of us, but they all begin with our coming to him, giving him the authority in our lives, and that authority includes telling us what to do, and then we go and do it. And it's not all unknown. God's call on Abraham and his call on us comes with a promise. To Abraham, he says, I will make your name great. You will be revered and respected. And if you think about it, the name and person of Abraham is held in the highest regard among Christians, Jews, and Muslims. God also promises you will be a blessing. God's not going to tell him the details, but he was going to use Abraham in such a way that many, many others would benefit. The world was going to be a better place because you lived, Abraham. In our group Thursday morning, I don't know how it was for some of your other groups, but the men all agree that every one of us would have been surprised at age 18 to see our lives now, stuff we didn't see coming. Perhaps where we'd be living, how we'd be making a living, or what achieving a goal that we had back then has meant and what it has brought with it. We have a glimpse into another call and blessing in the reading that Ellie gave for us. As the Gospel of John begins, we read about Jesus calling some of the first disciples. Miracles are happening. But Jesus tells Nathaniel and probably Philip and Andrew, you are going to see signs and wonders, angels ascending and descending, like the patriarch Jacob saw when God first called him. God has a call for your life could be teaching, parenting, preaching, healing, befriending, comforting, building affordable housing. could be a hundred things. 
There are many, many options. But yours is individually suited for who God has made you to be. He knows you. And there's good he can use. He had a purpose, and in that purpose, there will be a blessing. That's his promise. However, we see in Abraham's life that the command comes with a cost. When King David wanted to present an offering to the Lord, one of his loyal subjects offered to give him free of charge a prized heifer as the animal to be sacrificed. And David said, thanks but no thanks. I will not offer to the Lord a sacrifice that costs me nothing. It's not a sacrifice if there's no cost to you. The sacrifice, in a sense, is what matters. It demonstrates that the goodness of God is the surpassing value in your life. Now, for Abraham, that cost was summed up in one word. Leave. Leave your country, your kindred, and your father's house. Leave everything you've ever known. Everything that made you comfortable. You know, sometimes we read about ex-cons who commit crimes just so they can go back to jail because they're comfortable there. Now, maybe, for instance, you could make more money selling hula hoops. But God wants you to teach high school and reach inner city kids. You have to leave the money. Maybe you're living on the South Shore, but God, for reasons you don't know yet, has made it clear that you're supposed to go into the inner city, or the rural Midwest, or Namibia. The command to Abraham came with a cost, leave. But do you doubt that the blessing was worth the cost? Later in the Gospel of John, when the leaders of the religious establishment are challenging Jesus' claims to be the unique Son of God, they ask, are you older than our father Abraham? And Jesus answered, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And on that first Christmas night, when the preexistent Jesus took human form in that baby in Bethlehem, Abraham must have been like Eisenhower on D-Day. We've been working so long to get ready for this day. Now the rescue has begun. Then as the kingdom of God began to break out all around Jesus, healings, the estranged brought home, plenty where there had been want, Abraham rejoiced to see Jesus' day. All peoples on earth blessed themselves because Abraham had obeyed God's call. The blessing was worth the cost. I believe there is a great challenge for us to be obedient in spite of the cost. The Bible reminds us that Jesus was tempted in every way that we are. You know, there's that ad campaign that's right. He gets us. So he provides us in the Bible with vivid lessons, these ancient words, of how obedience to God is worth what we think it costs us. Now, God's words and rules are not arbitrary. If you have a besetting sin, if I say, a chronic fault that seems impossible to shake, consider if you have at some level convinced yourself that it's really all right, or at least not as bad as God's commands make it out to be. Oh, it's only gossip. So what if Jesus calls it murder? And God, in his mercy, allows you to see what your sin does. He removes the attraction of alternatives to obedience. That's a mercy he does. So you continue to gossip, and suddenly people don't want to be with you anymore. Because they figure, when you're not around, you talk about them. You experience the loneliness. Suddenly, superiority doesn't matter because it's not good for humans to be alone. 
cheating at school, on taxes, or on your spouse. When you see the natural consequences of those actions, suddenly obedience is much more attractive. God knows how to use both the carrot and the stick. This is why in addition to removing the attraction of the alternatives to obedience, he gives us glimpses of the reward for obedience. I, I tell people that we don't have a coffee hour anymore. It's a coffee hour and a half. I'm not complaining. Think, think of this, in a culture, literally, with an epidemic of loneliness. You come to our fellowship hall after service, you sit with friendly people, enjoy good food, and you are enveloped by the understanding that you belong, that you are loved, and that you are part of something important. That, my friend, is a glimpse of heaven, including the baked goods. Not every wrong will be set right before Jesus comes, but we will see glimpses of the reward. And some of them are a whole lot deeper than iced cranberry bread. God has a plan to get you out of debt. He can heal a broken marriage. There will be a cost to setting out on a journey with the Lord, but God will also provide you with glimpses of the heavenly reward. When Jesus met Nathanael. He said, follow me, to Philip too. And he said it to Matthew. He said it to Simon Peter. He invited them to join his journey. James and John had to leave their business and their father. Is there any doubt that God is calling you? It's the same journey that God called Abraham to go on. Listen for the voice of God and obey. Lord, what would you have? Teach me, Lord, I pray. Okay, then, how can I join Abraham's journey? I know there will be cost, but there is the promise that he will be where I am, or I will be where he is. And when everything else is going to be destroyed, what else could I want? When the one who promises is the one who showed us what love is, why else would I want anything else? Sign me up. What do I do? What you want to do is both recognize and walk the journey that God sets before you. Over and over in the New Testament, we're taught that God gives us charismata, spiritual gifts, to each believer for the building up of the body. What God gives us, he gives so that we will help others. And this, in turn, brings honor to himself. God's will for you the path he wants you to walk, will utilize those gifts. Twelves and fours are the Bible numbers to remember, to learn more about these gifts God has given you. Twelves and four. First Corinthians 12 and Romans 12 both talk about it. You know, sometimes scholars jab at the monks who came up with the chapter numbers, but they got these right. They give us old uh, mnemonics. And the fours are Ephesians 4 and 1 Peter 4. I know I don't have slots for that in the outline, but there's a blank back, I think. Some gifts are as simple as encouragement and helping others. And there are people who are really good at that, and they are so valuable. Others are leadership uh, or things that might even seem miraculous, like healing. But nothing is too difficult for God. And as you seek to walk a life that is pleasing to God, those you walk with, it's another way a small group is really important, those you walk with will be helpful in identifying the peculiar ways God is working through you. Lovely times, I've seen it time and time again in a small group over the years. Guys, I don't, what are my gifts? Do I have any gifts? And then, yeah, the group's ready to affirm. It's a good thing to do. We aren't intended to be alone. Small groups are especially suited to you to help you both recognize and walk the journey that God has prepared for you ahead of time. Did you notice that Philip said to Nathaniel, or when he found Nathaniel, he said to him, 
we have found the Messiah. Nobody had to say, so. In that culture, the invitation after that declaration was implicit. Of course you drop everything and follow. It's the Messiah. He's the one we've been waiting for. And the need today is just as great. Our joining Abraham's journey will have us encourage others to join his journey also. A seminar, a seminar I attended a week ago made it clear. All these so-called new moralities are not producing happier people. For instance, here's a clear statistical trend. The more sexual partners you have had, the more depressed you are. Don't hear that one on the news, do you? <laughs> now, the controllers of the media are hell-bent, and I mean that, on discrediting Christians. You know, the attitude seems to be ignore the 99 faithful and publicize the one crackpot. Well, what's a child of Abraham to do? Well, let the world observe with their own eyes that Christians are not hateful, that we are not unthinking. Let them see that we are caring, that we are careful, and that we engage in self-sacrificing behavior in order to see God's kingdom come. Then the invitation to join the journey will be welcome. And that's how some of you came to be with us. I never knew, it's an odd one, when I entered the pastoral ministry, that I would get to see how beautiful dying can be. I've heard lots of people say that they want to die quickly. And I know that no one wants to suffer. But I have seen many times over the last 38 years that the chance for two loved ones to say goodbye, friends, relatives, spouses, can be tremendous, awesome in beauty. There is a looking back and seeing the many, many good times, the many good achievements, and saying thank you at the journey's end. I have a page in my Bible where I've written down the names of well over a hundred people, wonderful people, excellent people, who are treasures I would not have known if I had not chosen to join Abraham's journey and follow Jesus. Don't you be afraid to join it either. We call him Father Abraham because he was the first to walk the journey God wants us all to join. Let's pray. Oh Lord, we pl place ourselves as clay in the potter's hand. The clay in becoming a useful vessel goes on quite a journey of transformation. We volunteer for that journey. Because we could be lumps or we could be something beautiful because the master has crafted us. Help us, Lord, to surrender and to respond to your shaping. In Jesus' name. And on this journey, he leadeth us. That's the blessed thought. Let's sing 635.
lead us, O Lord, into the week you have for us. May we be found faithful. May we take hold of your strong hand. And may we reach out to others to join as well. In Jesus' name.